We know all children are curious. We were probably all curious at one point in our life. We take joy in learning things. And many of us have probably sat in a class and we're like, ah, oh, this is boring. Right? Yeah, you're all laughing because you just finished that class. Right? Well, that conversation in mathematics started in 1928. It's a little disappointing. We know children come into classes. We know all of us have different kinds of abilities. We take all kinds of tests. We sit in classes where one size fits all, though. We know it's not a good idea. And we knew it 90 years ago. There's kind of a theme here. Uh, you know, spoiler alert. How many of you sat in math class? When am I ever going to use it? Come on, don't be shy. Everybody put your hand up. I, you know, I saw you in class. Right? How many of you are interested in what's going on around you? Right? And how many of you heard somebody say, boy, you're a lot more sophisticated than I was at your age, right? I mean, just think about it. The youth of today have the whole world right here on their two thumbs. Right. And what's amazing to me is when I put a calculator in their hand and they still use their two thumbs. Anyway. <laughs> that conversation started back in 31. So Island Bishop down in Australia says that there's six things that all cultures do. It's not exhaustive, but it gives us a way to think about what's happening in our classrooms and what's happening in the lives of our children and the learners that are coming into our classroom. And this particular diagram, all of these pieces are connected because they're not mutually exclusive events. They don't happen independent of one another. All of these things are happening simultaneously. And if you think about your experience as, a, as learning a new game, someone explained it to you, you learned how to do it, they modeled it for you, or maybe you helped somebody build something or design something, for children who live on the tundra, if they find themselves not able to find the sun, they can dig down into the snow, find the grass, see the direction that it's laying, and know where the prevailing wind was the previous season, and then they know of northeast, south, and west. For children in Alaska and the Yupik communities, and this is a project that I worked on with Jerry Lipka at Fairbanks, Many of them come into the schools with a measuring system that's based on the body. It's not based on metric. It's not based on the English units. It's not based on walking into the kayak store in Old Town, Maine and buying yourself a, I want the blue one. Right? And what's interesting and important about this measuring system, sorry ladies, it's built for the man who was going to paddle the kayak. And he has to be in harmony with that kayak and with the water. The waters in Alaska are unforgiving. Hypothermia is just seconds away. And so they build these traditional kayaks specific to the man who's going to sit in and paddle it. My friend Shivani, when she visits her grandma in India, sees these designs on the front porch of the house. And they're made with flour. And the idea is about the harmony between the insects and the humans at the threshold of the home. I see this, and I see the symmetry. I see the design. I see the pattern. But she hears the story from her grandmother. She hears the story from her aunties. She hears the story of her mom and the stories that she's going to pass on in her future. So what happens when a child introduces a counting system? When my daughter was in the kindergarten, we lived in Grand Junction, Colorado. And there was a young girl in her class who was a Spanish speaker, and she didn't have very much English. And she was very passive in the classroom, you can imagine, right? And so my daughter's teacher, Shannon, she, she was brilliant, and probably still is today. 
she got this young girl to teach the rest of the students how to count in her first language in Spanish. And all of a sudden it changed the complete dynamic in the classroom. And she felt like she, was a, she belonged there. And she felt like she had some ownership. And she felt like the, the, the mathematics and now she had new friends, right? So my cousin Michael spent 30 years teaching in Tucson Unified down in, uh, in the Southwest. He was a mathematics middle school teacher, and he's an artist. And part of his art class was throwing pots, throwing clay. And he had a couple of middle school students that just threw brilliant pots. They were symmetric. They were just beautiful. But it wasn't what you would expect from someone in those grades. So Michael started talking to these children. He says, you know, what's up? Well, it turns out their family comes from a region in Mexico. And for generations, their family have harvested the clay and thrown pots. And these boys had been watching and learning. And this was just something to do, right? So what happens when Michael invites those family members in to talk to the students? Because I have to tell you, as a math educator, I see these pots as a different exploration of surface area, a different ex exploration of volume, right? So this idea of confluence, what happens when we bring these ideas into the mathematics classroom? And how do these stories emerge? And what, what changes in the classroom? This is from the Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico. The center pot is referred to as a wedding base. And the woman who made this, she harvested the clay, she harvested the minerals. So she knew where to locate that, if we think back to what Bishop had said. She knew how to design this. In fact, she knew how to design this from an image she had in her mind, her visual spatial reasoning. She was able to get it to her fingertips to do this. She was able to use the hair of animals to paint these designs on this curved surface. I can't imagine trying to get the symmetry correct on a piece of paper, much less on a curved surface. And the same with the pot to your left with all the designs on it. Again, it's a spherical object and to be able to do this. So what happens when we think about those elders and these, and these people with these rich skills that are generational and we bring them into the classroom? And we have them talk about these ideas and share these stories. Paula Thorne is a Penobscot basket maker. In fact, she's a very highly regarded Penobscot basket maker. And this is a basket of a blueberry. And it's a little bit bigger than a blueberry, but it's not much bigger than this. It's made from ash from the tree. And the green on the top is made from sweet grass. And we know sweet grass occurs in the confluence between the salt water and the fresh water. And as Paula explained to me, she knows that she can't harvest the sweet grass until it's flowered and seeded so that there should be sweet grass for the next generation, for the next season. Right? She knows when to harvest the ash. She knows how to prepare the ash. And she knows how to get these baskets from her mind's eye to her fingertip and produce these. So how does that dynamic and that discourse in a classroom possibly change when, when Paula comes into the classroom and talks about this process and about this designing and building and about locating these materials and then thinking about surface areas, thinking about volume, okay? And if you look at this at two dimensions, um, um, I don't want anybody to get upset, but if you think about it in two dimensions, we can curve fit, okay? Take you back to your high school experience. But think about this idea of how do we get this from our mind to our fingertips? This is an anastomotic hood. This is what occurs on the surface of the heart when someone has a coronary artery bypass graft. They physically bypass the blockage on the surface of the heart. They harvest the saphenous vein from your leg. And when they do this, you'll notice on the top there's a slight little rise. That's called the anastomotic hood. And the purpose of that hood is to allow scar tissue to develop so that the blood flow isn't impeded because scar tissue is going to develop. But if they left it just as a regular piece of conduit without that hood, 
then that scar tissue would potentially block that blood flow and, it wouldn't, and then the, the problem wouldn't have been solved. It's really quite fascinating. I spent months in the operating room watching surgeons do these. And they do these operations wearing glasses with a uh, magnification of seven. And mostly, from my perspective, the sutures are so small, they can't see them without this magnification. With my naked eye, I could only see these sutures if they reflected in the light over the operating table. So they're able to get these sutures equally spaced around this perimeter, and they're able to pull them tight enough. Could you imagine the tension on, this, on the human heart? They're able to pull these tight enough so when they take the, the patient off a of bypass, the blood flows without leaking. It's a really sophisticated problem that you experience at the house when the pipes start leaking under the sink and the plumber comes in. Right? But is it really that much different than what Paula does when she builds a basket and she uses her visual spatial reasoning to get these ideas from her mind to her fingertips to these beautiful designs? And in Paula's words, the most important thing is to make sure she doesn't construct a homely basket. If it's homely, nobody sees it. It goes on the fire pile. So this is from my friend Frank Finley. He's a Salish man. He lives on the Salish Kootenai Reservation up in Polson, Montana. And these are Blackfeet teepees. The actual image is much better than the photograph. Sorry for that. And if you've never seen a teepee, there's an entryway, there's a smoke hole on the top. And as you can tell, most if you've, if you've never been to a powwow or been to an, uh, seen an indigenous teepee, you'll see that there are designs around the, on the surface of the teepee. And these designs tell stories. And they tell who the family is, and they tell who they are, right? And they tell who their ancestors are. Ed Doolittle says in a paper, he was talking about this, it's easy to look at a teepee and think about it as a cone. But it's really not. It's got smells, it's got sound, it's got ritual. It's completely different and it rivals the cone. So when you have an indigenous youth in your classroom and she or he comes from a community of teepees, what happens when we hear those stories and we hear these associations if we think about it in, a, in, in an ever simplistic way as a cone? Those get lost, but then the discourse changes when we bring the elders into the classroom, when we bring the elders into the school. In this work, these authors are talking about practices against culture that go against the way that children learn in their communities. But yet they sit in classrooms, and so there's this conflict of what happens in these learning spaces. And we could probably do better. I think we, I think we should do better. Gregory Cayete, who's from the Tiwa Pueblo, he talks about knowledge and how it's gained and how it's for the lived experience. And we've probably all heard someone at one point or another in our education say, well, we're preparing you for life, right? Or whatever that means. Right? You have to make up your own. But it's about relationships, community, the people, the plants, the whole of nature. And when these youngsters are sitting in our classrooms, it's very different than saying ax squared plus bx plus c. Uh, solve for, you know, right, solve the quadratic equation from that. Right? When we think about these lived experience that they have, and we think about how they're learning, what does that mean when we go into the classroom? What could it have meant for you when you were in the classroom? So I work in this area called ethnomathematics, and that's just a sample of ideas that have changed my mind shift over the last 20 years. Obertan Jambrojo is a trained mathematician. He's a he's emeritus professor. He lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he coined this phrase back in 1985. And so if you think about the word culture very loosely and very broadly, but if you think about it with respect to jargons and codes, 
Think about the last time there was a skilled tradesperson in your house and she was working on the electric, electric or she was working on the plumbing. And she was talking to the other plumber. You might have had that experience where like, what are they talking about? My pipe leaks. I don't understand their language, right? How many of you have been in, the phys in your physician's office and you realize if you don't, you, you'll walk away from this today. Geez, I'm just a number. How tall are you? How much do you weigh? What are your medications? What's your oxygen saturation? What's your blood pressure? All right? And that just starts the conversation. And then someone walks in or... You know, when, the, when, the, when your doc has got his stethoscope on your neck or on your feet, I said to my doctor last week during the physical, I said, are you hearing any bruise in my carotid? And everybody's familiar with that language, correct? Right? Yeah, so the first time I heard brewery, I had no idea what it was. I had a medical dictionary. It didn't come up in there. It turns out it's a French word, right? And so it's, they can hear the physical blockage in your carotid artery. And in fact, the trained listener can quantify it actually quite accurately just from that first hearing to be able to say, yeah, you probably should see a, a specialist. If your primary care physician sends you to a specialist because they heard a blockage, it's probably in their ears better than 50%. Right? So they have this special codes and jargon that we don't necessarily understand but it has to do with quantity, and it's different than what we do in the mathematics classroom, and it's different than many of the experiences that some of us have had in, uh, in schooling. And it's based on motivation. So these are two buddies of mine. They live down in Oro Preto, Brazil, Daniel Ori and Milton Rosa. And they say these things are happening when we think about the dimensions of FMO mathematics and we think about this confluence of ideas that come into our classroom as that discourse changes and as students share their experiences and as we bring others into the, into the fold, as we bring elders into the fold, as we bring experts into the fold, as we, if we were to bring samurai into the classroom and his expertise in FMO musicology, right? And then we see these relationships build. The relationships like the young girl who had Spanish in my daughter's kindergarten class. Right? And the whole theme today so far has been about relationships. I don't know what your relationship was with mathematics. Maybe good, maybe bad, maybe what, like Narakar said, yuck. Okay. But in this field, in this work, and the people that are doing this work, we realize is it embrace it. it's embracing. It gives people ownership. It changes the talk. It changes the language. It changes the attitude. For 20 years, oh, you, you do math, just like Narakar said, yuck. Right? And there's never been anybody in between, sadly. You know? I either hate it or actually I've had people say they were really good at it. But there's no, there doesn't seem to be any, any middle life. So when this happens, we have an opportunity for a third space in the classroom. And this, is, this goes back to Jerry Lifka's work. And this third space is between that power domain of the teacher and the community and where that child comes from. And if you think about that, and then we have this third space where, where really interesting things can occur. And, the, and our experiences in the schools can change. And at this point, this third space isn't, isn't specific to mathematics. This third space can happen in any classroom. But we can think about it as a pedagogical bridge between the, the space of the classroom to the community. And that bridge, we want to be two-directional. We want to have an open flow of communication going back and forth, and we want to get, engage our learners differently. Right? Unfortunately, I happen to be in the field, and Gabriel and, and probably others of you, and you know, everybody has heard that, you know, how does the United States do on math scores, right? For some reason, that becomes my whole problem. I remember sitting at a table with a group of men, and they said, oh, my gosh, how come we're doing so bad in math? I'm like, fellas, I don't own this, right? <laughs> you know. So maybe there's some things that we should be thinking about in these classrooms and how this space is evolving. I do a lot of my work with a gentleman named John Bear Mitchell. He's Penobscot. He lives in uh, Old Tom, Maine. And these are some of the things that have changed our mindset over the last 20 years. And these are the things that uh, 
I've spent my professional life on, and there's, that's, there's my, my Reader's Digest version of my last 20 years yesterday. Thank you.